Hello, it's Landon Ligotti, founder of Food Secure Future, a place for people of all ages and backgrounds to share ideas and learn about the most pressing food security issues. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. George Jander, who has too many accomplishments to list, but to name a few, he received a PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics from Harvard University. Since 2002, Dr. Jander has been a faculty member at the Boyce Thompson Institute in Ithaca, New York, with an adjunct appointment in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell. Dr. Jander is a world-renowned expert in using biochemical and genetic approaches to investigate plant resistance to insect herbivory. Hello, Dr. Jander, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I, rec I recently read a scary statistics from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization that up to 40% of global crop production is lost to plant pests and diseases. So with that being said, I'd like to discuss the role of CRISPR in creating the next agricultural revolution. So my first question for you today is, could you briefly explain to our audience what CRISPR is and how it differs from traditional genetic modification techniques used in agriculture? Yeah, so first off, what CRISPR is is actually a bacterial defense system against viruses. So uh, bacteria, like all animals and plants, get infected by viruses, and they have a unique defense mechanism where they can store parts of the viral genome and then use that to do a targeted cutting of new viruses that enter these bacterial cells. And so the um, unique adaptation now was the realization that you can adapt this system to cut any DNA. So rather than taking viral DNA and cutting viral DNA, you can clone animal or human DNA and use the viral CRISPR protein called Cas9 in many cases, and then cut any DNA that you want to, whether it's plant or animal or bacterial or fungal. And then you have a cut in that DNA and in, typically there's errors in the repair system and you end up with small changes or small deletions in the DNA. And so this is different from other types of plant modification systems. So traditional breeding would involve crosses between different plant varieties, or you would maybe even cross with another species, or you can do what's called mutation breeding. You can do random mutagenesis with either a chemical or with radiation and induce similar changes in plants. That is small the deletions or additions in the genome. And that can now be accomplished with CRISPR in a much more targeted manner. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that we've been able to come up with this technology. And it's so the reason it's so much better than, say, just breeding is that, as you said, it's more selective and it's much quicker, I'd assume, as well. Yeah, I think speed and accuracy are really the two advantages to using CRISPR for improving plants. So there's probably nothing that you couldn't do with random mutagenesis. It's, you know, with chemicals or radiation, it's the sort of the, the classical example is the monkeys and typewriters. If you have enough monkeys and enough typewriters, then eventually you get the works of Shakespeare. So if you have a plant genome and, you know, make enough mutations, you can eventually find any mutation that you want to. And if you're simply, let's say, trying to knock out a specific gene, you could probably mutate it with a chemical, make several thousand mutations in each plant, and you'd only have to screen a, a few thousand plants to find exactly the gene knockout that you want to. But that takes a lot of effort. And so the approach with CRISPR would be to, rather than doing this randomly, you decide which gene you want to knock out or change the expression of and do this in a much more targeted manner. Yeah, it's amazing how much more efficient it is. Yeah. So uh, that's... Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's just a, a more targeted way of mutagenizing a genome. And probably the other advantage I should mention is a reduced chance of side effects. Because if you're you know, crossing different plant varieties or doing random mutagenesis, you're almost certainly going to have changes that you didn't anticipate. That's also the case with CRISPR, but the odds of getting changes that you weren't anticipating are much, much lower with using CRISPR mutagenesis. Yeah. So are there any real limits to CRISPR or what we're trying to modify? I, I guess the biggest limit is right now it's really used to just change existing genomes. So you're not using CRISPR to put new genes into plants. So you couldn't use CRISPR, let's say, to put an apple gene into a tomato 
you're only able to modify tomato genes sort of in situ, either by making small tweaks in their you know, sequence or knocking them out completely. But you can't completely change the genome of a plant using CRISPR at this point. So could you say take one variety of tomato and implant a gene from that variety into another variety, or is it just, it has to be the uh, same genome? It has to be the same genome. And what, what you could do is you could try to modify a tomato variety, let's say an existing gene, and modify it with CRISPR to be more similar to a gene in another tomato variety. Let's say you have a, a resistance gene that is targeted at a specific bacterial pathogen. If it's not present in your tomato, but let's say you have a gene that's fairly similar, you might be able to use CRISPR to make you know, targeted changes in that gene to, try to tweak it to make it a resistance gene to the pathogen that you're worried about, uh, rather than you know, crossing the tomato varieties and bringing in this gene. Or you know, if the gene is in a related species that you know, has similar genes but can't be crossed to tomatoes, you know, with some effort with CRISPR, you might be able to modify an existing tomato resistance gene to have a, a different specificity against a pathogen that it wouldn't normally be targeting. So there are, are opportunities of that kind. Wow. So I know we've already went over the main advantages of CRISPR, but can you provide some specific examples of how CRISPR has already been used to improve crops? I mean, there's not a lot that's been um, already commercialized, but there are some examples that have been you know, in the popular press. So examples would be, let's say, non-browning mushrooms or non-browning apples. So there are specific enzymes in things like apples and mushrooms that when you cut them, they become brown, so it's called polyphenol oxidases. And it's possible to use CRISPR to knock out those enzymes, and then you would have non-browning fruits or, or mushrooms. And you know, there's not a real clear advantage to that other than you know, consumer acceptance and people don't like to eat apples that have turned brown. And so that's a, something that you know, is probably marketable. Another example would be there's a company called Pearwise that has made mustard greens that are um, less strong tasting. So mustard greens are very nutritious, but they have a strong you know, taste to them. And Pearwise has knocked out a whole suite of genes that would be you know, responsible for the strong taste of mustard greens. And so again, this is something that promotes con consumer acceptance, makes them more palatable. Um, other things would be like a I think it's again pairwise that's trying to make uh, blackberries that don't have seeds. So again, it's something that's not absolutely necessary, but you know, nice to have. So you don't get the the blackberry seeds stuck between your teeth when you're eating blackberries. And so those are sort of consumer oriented changes that are being implemented already. And otherwise, you know, there are probably also things that are in the pipeline of many, many of the major companies trying to increase yield or increase. You know, tolerance to various biotic and abiotic stresses that haven't been commercialized yet. It's hmm. amazing. Yeah. So how does CRISPR technology impact the environment compared to traditional farming practices? Are there any long-term ecological benefits or risks associated with using CRISPR modified crops? I would say that the risk is quite low. Um, again, you're doing it in a very targeted manner. And specifically, if you then get rid of the enzyme that you use to make the CRISPR mutation, the Cas9 enzyme, all you have is a small mutation in a background of the regular plant genome. And if that plant were out in the field, there's actually no way that you or anybody else could tell me how the mutation was made, whether it was made with CRISPR or whether it was you know, a random mutation as the plant is growing out in nature or whether it was chemically or radiation induced. So in that respect, you're really not creating anything with CRISPR that wouldn't happen naturally in a plant at, at some level. And so if you were, say, you know, worried about making a super weed, I mean, you know, a plant that really, you know, goes out in nature and takes over, you know, if that really were possible by making small changes in the genome, that would have happened a long time ago, because there'd be a very strong selection for those sorts of plants. And you know, those mutations would occur naturally and would have happened by now. But Clearly, that hasn't happened. And so I would say the environmental risk of using CRISPR is, is low. 
and certainly lower than other approaches that we've used, like you know, breeding with uh, wild relatives of plants can bring in genes that we don't know about, or again, random mutagenesis makes lots more changes than CRISPR does and has a higher risk of you know, causing problems in agriculture. Yeah. So are there really any risks associated with CRISPR or genetically modifying crops? Um, I guess, you know, it's in terms of scientific or, you know, nutritional risk, I would say it's low. In terms of, you know, philosophical risk, you know, some people don't like the, the idea of, you know, tinkering with, with nature. In that case, you know, there could be objections and that's certainly going to be happening in the long run. But in terms of, you know, are we going to create plants that um, are more dangerous? I would say that risk is very low um, simply because these are things that are, could be happening naturally. So it's very different from, let's say, moving genes from one species to another because that's not, not what's happening when you're using CRISPR to modify plants. And so in that respect, it has a much lower risk than other forms of genetic engineering. Yeah, it pretty much sounds like a no-brainer to me. So many benefits and yep. barely any risk. Mm -hmm. So looking ahead, what do you see as the most exciting potential development in agricultural biotechnology using CRISPR? How do you envision CRISPR shaping the future of global food security and sustainability? I mean, I guess there are a lot of sort of interesting applications. Um, one would be, you know, domestication of new crops. So for instance, you know, all the crops that we currently use are massively changed from their wild ancestors. So, you know, let's say cabbage, you know, the wild relatives of cabbage are just small weedy plants, you know, growing in Europe. And they've been modified over years to make cabbage that we eat. And the same goes for any other crop that we're eating. You know, corn looks very different from its wild ancestor, Teosinte. And again, a series of mutations that have been selected over thousands of years have resulted in corn domestication. And so the idea is that there are probably plants out there that could be domesticated or improved for human consumption in a much faster way. So in the order of you know, tens of years instead of thousands of years to make a, a crop plant more suitable for you know, cultivation if for human consumption. And so whether this is taking new grasses and turning them into a food source or taking things like, you know, um, I guess one example would be golden berries or ground cherries, which are, you know, sort of a, a, a crop for human consumption, but aren't really grown commercially here much in the US because there are traits that make them less useful for commercial production. And so there's groups, including here at the Boyce Thompson Institute, where I'm working, that are trying to make targeted mutations in ground cherries to make them more suitable for commercial production here in New York State. So basically, creating a new crop for New York state farmers to use. Um, so that I think is one great potential. It's just accelerating the development of new crops. Um, other examples would be disease resistance. I mentioned already that, you know, we could make targeted mutagenesis type approaches to uh, basically engineer new disease resistance genes in plants that we currently have or adapt current resistance genes in those plants and make them uh, to target pathogens that have arisen in our crop plants. And otherwise, I mean, there are lots of other sort of consumer-oriented things that could be done. You know, we mentioned the mustard greens and the non-browning apples, but imagine things like coffee, you know, so right now decaffeinated coffee is made through a, a chemical extraction process, which gets rid of the caffeine, but also gets rid of some of the flavor components. But what if we used CRISPR to mutagenize coffee to just knock out the caffeine biosynthesis pathway, then we could commercially grow coffee plants that don't make caffeine and you know, probably have coffee that tastes better than chemically extracted decaffeinated coffee and probably is also better for the environment because you don't have this chemical extraction process but are just growing coffee plants in their national, natural environment but they don't produce caffeine. And the other big one is yield, you know, so yield is, is lots of things, everything from resistance to drought to insect resistance to pest tolerance to just producing more seeds. And that, again, is something where, you know, a better knowledge of plant genomes 
and you know, targeted application of CRISPR can address a lot of these things that together influence yield and can increase the productivity of crop plants. And so, you know, food security is an issue in the world. You know, we're undoubtedly still having population increases. And there are really only two approaches to this. One is to put more land into cultivation or to get more food from the existing land. And I would say CRISPR is one approach to increase productivity in a you know, rational manner and grow more food on the existing land resources that are available for growing food. Yeah. So, I, so lots of potential applications and, you know, the, the sort of the sky's the limit. Not everything is going to be solved by CRISPR, but there are a lot of useful things that can be done and will be done in agriculture, both in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. Yeah, I think CRISPR could be play a huge role in helping um, food security around the world. Mm -hmm. Can you um, use CRISPR to increase the temperature range of tolerance of a plant? In some cases, probably yes. But again, this is something where um, we don't really know that much yet about what enables plants to tolerate higher temperatures. And so I would say this problems like that are still too complicated to, to really address in a targeted manner like this. So we don't know enough about you know, what makes some plants more tolerant to heat stress than others. I mean, we know some genes that are involved and it may be possible to target those genes, but I would say at this point, uh, nobody can tell you, you know, if we want to make, you know, wheat more drought tolerant or more heat tolerant, we have to knock out these three genes and you know, guarantee success. So there's still going to be a lot of trial and error in approaches of that kind. Yeah. Sky's the limit, as you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think, thank you very much for talking with me and good luck with your podcast. Or thank you. YouTube. Yes, and whatever you are doing with this.